your life. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are here today to get an update on the ongoing issues surrounding the Maryland Environmental Service. And in my view, inappropriate payouts to senior level staff at that agency. In some ways, I feel like this is deja vu. Less than 15 years ago, I led a review of personnel practices within the executive branch under a previous governor, and we passed legislation that should have prevented what we are here to discuss today. And yet, two months ago, the Baltimore Sun reported that hundreds of thousands of dollars of taxpayers' money was paid out to a single employee who was leaving MES to become the governor's chief of staff. At that time, I called on Roy McGrath to return the money. The single highest duty we have as legislators and elected officials is to maintain public trust and protect taxpayer money. Today, we will get an update from members of the Joint Committee on Fair Practices and State Personnel Oversight on the status of the investigation and collectively determine what next steps might be appropriate to safeguard public trust. Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you members of the Legislative Policy Committee for joining us today. Uh, certainly in the midst of a pandemic uh, and the economic uh, crisis that is before us, this is not what we uh, thought we would be doing, nor did we want to do. But unfortunately, it is necessary that this is the topic of today's conversation moving forward. Uh, allegations of corruption and misuse of power are serious, and they require immediate attention. Uh, it is too important that we uh, have the facts to make the appropriate decisions, and we cannot await uh, to emerge from the current situation in order to restore faith and trust in Maryland's government. Um, I was pleased today to see the governor has put forward some options for potential reform of the Maryland Environmental Service. Uh, as the speaker and I have told the governor directly, uh, the General Assembly will be moving forward with reform legislation this upcoming session, and we look forward to working in a bipartisan manner to get this incredibly important organization back on track and restore the public trust. Unfortunately, Reform simply for reform's sake is meaningless if we don't know fully what is broken. If we don't know the problem, we will not come up with the right solution. Information is what will help us to name the problem and solve the problem. As we move forward, it's essential that we restore the public and local government and state government's faith in an institution that has had a storied history. I, along with hundreds of Marylanders and with many members of this committee, watched the hearings of the Joint Committee on Fair Practices and State Personnel Oversight with amazement and extreme disappointment. I wanna thank the committee members uh, of the Joint Committee for their incredible work thus far, trying to get to the facts. Uh, and I hope to continue this work as we dig further into this important issue. Uh, I would like to now call on the chairs of the committee uh, to present a, uh, what their findings thus far. Uh, we will begin with Delegate Eric Barron. Uh, members of the Legislative Policy Committee would ask that as the members of the Joint Committee are presenting to please uh, hold your questions until we've had a presentation so that we can have a full discussion after members have had the opportunity uh, to present their findings so far. Uh, Delegate Barron. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Speaker, Mr. President, and members of the Legislative Policy Committee. It's an honor to be with you this afternoon. Um, the Joint Committee was initially charged with investigating the payment made by the Maryland Environmental Service to the Governor's Chief of Staff, Roy McGrath, including why the payment was made, who reviewed it, and how such payments can be prevented in the future. In the course of examining those issues, others have emerged. 
My co-chair, Senator Clarence Lamb, will outline our brief presentation. Thanks again. Thank you, Delegate Barron, and thank you to the members of the committee. It is an honor to be with you this afternoon, although I wish it was under uh, better circumstances. We have before us some uh, concerns that have been presented to the Joint Committee on Fair Practices and State Personnel Oversight that have been very concerning. Since the Sun story broke um, about five weeks ago, we have held uh, two hearings over spanning over five hours with uh, more than 10 witnesses including several document requests that have been made of this administration. We've also received hundreds of pages of documents from the Maryland Environmental Service and the governor's office. Um, as we begin this um, hearing, uh, we will have our delegates uh, summarize what we've learned so far. And then that will be followed by Senate representatives who will combine more of what we've learned into the broader picture and greater context uh, to convey to this committee. And we'll wrap with outlining any questions that may remain. Um, with that, let me close and turn it over to uh, Chairman Barron. Thank you. Jake, am I sharing? We are it is sharing now. Um, Chairman Barron, feel free to begin at your when you're ready. Thank you. So we know Mr. McGrath took a large payout, a payout package that he alleges the governor approved. We know the governor denies he approved it. Both can't be true. That's a major issue, but other, others have emerged while we've been examining this, including, and in no particular order, one, uh, questionable expenses, travel, auto use, and leave, the role of the agency's board of directors, the culture at the agency and its impact on the agency's mission, and the broader potential implications for other independent state agencies and the appointments process generally. Now, as for the severance, uh, and Delegate Corman will go into this in a little more detail, but I'll dispense with a few preliminaries up front. The Maryland Environmental Service is a state agency. Its executive director is a state official. The governor and the executive director of MES have total control of the agency. Now, as you've heard, we conducted two hearings. We've received responses to requests for documents, and most of the witnesses responded to our request to appear. Uh, we had most of the board members present, most of the officers. We had the new uh, uh, executive director of MES, and we've had uh, a number of documents from the agency and from the governor's off office produced. But the picture is not clear. We're missing Mr. McGrath, and we're missing one of his officers in the agency, Matthew Sharing who really uh, was uh, a close right hand to Mr. McGrath. And you'll hear more about that later. Now, what I can say about this payout is that the decision to award it took less than 48 hours from the time Mr. McGrath announced his new job as the governor's chief of staff to the board of directors. That happened on the morning of May 26. Now, what happened after that email announcement is outlined in this next clip. Jake. Governor's chief of staff. And then can we put up that email? Uh, I have it as page 12. Um, uh, not, let's see. Yes, that one. Um, this is from 
uh, Beth Walton, and I, I may be pronouncing her na name wrong. I apologize if so, but she's the she was the deputy director under Mr. McGrath. Is that correct, Mr. Snee? Yes, sir. That is correct. She's Mr. McGrath's number two. Yes, sir. So Mr. McGrath's number two is emailing you May 27th at 10 a.m. with this. What is this for? Can you? Do you have any context for what why she's sending you this? I believe it was for me as the HR uh, committee chair to be informed of the total ask by Mr. McGrath and what he was asking for and what he was going to carry over in his new role, role in the governor's office. And I think that was followed up then by the, uh, you know, the the actions of the HR committee where I was instructed to call Mr. Well, I'd McGrath. Like to go step by step, please. I, I, I just. I'm sorry, Delegate, did you want to stop? No, nope, go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. I just want to make sure I understand. Did this email come out of the blue or was there some communication where she or Mr. McGrath said they're going to send you what the, what the ask is? I don't recall um, asking for that email. But when you got it, you knew what it, you knew that this was his ask upon his departure to, to be the governor's chief of staff. That is correct. Okay. And so am I correct also that um, a half an hour later, there was an HR committee meeting of the board at 10 30. is that right um, it's like a, a part one and a part two one part one of the hr committee of the board was on may 27th and then there was a part two um the next day correct um the MES HR committee met, um, I believe it may have been two meetings, you're correct. At the initial meeting, Dr. Street, Mr. Addison instructed me as the committee chair to reach out to Mr. McGrath and confirm that the um, second floor had approved this. Wait, Mr. Wait, McGrath, if you Hold on one second, if you don't mind. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm what sorry. happened at the meeting, the the part one HR board meeting? What happened at that meeting? Well, Dr. Street, Mr. Addison, I met to request to discuss the ads. Um, we didn't feel comfortable with it. Therefore, why didn't you feel comfortable with it? Uh, it was a lateral position change. So Mr. Bergrath was going from MES director to chief of staff, and we didn't think that the severance was necessary unless it was approved by someone outside our chain of command. And Mr. McGrath assured us that that was the case. At this meeting, uh, had there been any materials provided to the HR committee to, to decide whether this was appropriate? Not that I recall. And the board does not have a severance policy, right? We, we, asked, we asked for that. And what we got back was just a piece of paper saying MES doesn't have a severance policy. So it, that, it does is not. that correct? That okay. is correct. And the director doesn't have an employment contract, right? So you didn't have that before you either, right? That is correct. The, the joint committee asked for that. We got a piece of paper that said we don't have, director doesn't have a employment contract. Uh, were there any other materials or information before the committee at that point to decide on this uh, nearly quarter of a million dollar payout for a voluntary leave to be the governor's chief of staff? Not that I recall, Mr. Chair. 
so the board didn't, or the, the, at least the, the HR committee at that point didn't feel comfortable and, and said what to whom? Well, I was directed to call Mr. McGrath and see if this severance was approved by um, the governor's office since he'd be moving into his new role as chief of staff. And he assured me that that was the case. And that was also reflected in Ms. Wooten's email to me where it was bolded. I believe the operative right. sentence was we're gonna, bolded. We're gonna put that back up. At, um, <clears throat> just be before that though, I just, it, it was Mr. Street that asked you, Mr. Street and Mr. Addison that asked you to, to get this information from the governor's office or from a grant? From a grant, yes, sir. Or from a grant, okay. Um, so yes, let's fast forward to the Woten email on May 27th. This is just a little bit later in the day. Hope this helps. Had you had you talked to McGrath before this? You got this email. Um, I, I'm not sure of the sequence, Mr. Chair. But all I can say is, I did talk to McGrath. He assured me um, that this had been approved, and the HR committee relied on his representation. And um, that's after I was directed to talk to McGrath. But at some point, you got this email, and and correct me if I'm wrong, this was a, as a follow-up to the board meeting and perhaps a further follow-up from a conversation you had with Mr. McGrath about uh, the, the, the appropriateness of his severance ask. I, th I think that's accurate, yes. Okay, and, and, and so Mr. McGrath, number two, sends you this email and she has bold faced, bait, bold faced, excuse me, uh, quote, Roy says, Roy, Mr. Mr. McGrath says that the, go quote, the governor anticipates a severance equal to one year's salary. Am I reading that right? Yes, sir. And then she goes even further. Um, the last bullet, she suggests what your motion should be. She's suggesting what what you should say uh, to the board, is that right? Yes. And she says that uh, the, the motion should basically say that this is in appreciation uh, and, and in recognition that Mr. McGrath will be serving as chief of staff to the governor in the state of Maryland, right? That's what it says, yes. Okay. And I, I so and then if we fast forward in time, um on May 28th, I believe at 9 a.m., there's that part two of the the human resources committee meeting, right? Correct. The next morning, right? And did, did, what, what happened at that meeting? I reported to Dr. Street and Mr. Addison that I had spoken with former Director McGrath. Um, he assured me that the severance was approved. And um, with that, um, the recommendation went to the full board for action. Um, we relied solely on that representation of Mr. McGrath. When you say you relied solely on that representation, meaning we know you didn't have uh, a severance policy in front of you, correct? Correct. You didn't have an employment contract before you, is that correct? Correct. You didn't have, uh, uh, so the, the director and the deputy director are, are they're entitled uh, under some board resolution, uh, I think M MES is, entitles them to uh, some kind of an incentive pay or incentive reward. Is that right? 
Right, that's part of the BEST program that Mr. Addison described. Okay, did you have BEST program information before you about Mr. McGrath? No, we did not. Did you have any reports or any materials or any information whatsoever when you made the decision to give this payout to Mr. McGrath? No, sir. The only thing we would have had was Ms. Wilton's email. Okay. Um, I'd like to just, just briefly, uh, Mr. Addison, on this same subject. Now we we we've heard a lot of uh, you know something's cust customary and the practice, but if something's customary and practice, you don't have to be pressured into it. Uh, you, you, in your opening statements, you said something about uh, you felt caught between a rock and a hard place. Can you? What do you mean? Well, I think I think it's pretty simple. I mean, you got. Uh, somebody who's going to a position uh, working for the governor that really is going to control a lot of what the state does. And it was a, uh, uh, it, it's a very powerful position that's going to have an impact on MES. All right, Jake. All right, am I sharing my screen? You're good. Thank you. So just to summarize, um, we had McGrath notifying the board, I'm going to be chief of staff to the governor. The next morning is number two says, this is what I want on his behalf. Just a little bit later, when they're uh, set to decide on this payout, this ask, the board's not comfortable. They push back. So then it's a little bit later in the afternoon, and there may have been a phone call or two between one of the board members and Mr. McGrath. Uh, there's that second email from McGrath's deputy, hope this helps. And we saw, you know, the bold faced, we saw the, the uh, suggestion of the motion to the board. And then by the next morning, the payout is approved. Now, it wasn't based on any severance policy. There was none. There was no employment contract. There was no performance related information. Matter of fact, there were no records or materials before the board whatsoever that informed this decision. This was not a termination or retirement, not anything like what is common, uh, uh, you know, parlance when someone is uh, 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 getting a, a severance. And we have board members with decades of experience with the agency saying that this was not customary or longstanding practice. But they gave the payout anyway. Why? Because they felt pressure. And so they wanted to make sure it was good with the governor and his office. They relied on Mr. McGrath's representations to that effect. How did they feel? How did the board feel about what they were doing? When Mr. McGrath asked for this, quite frankly, we were caught by, between a rock and a hard place. It seemed as though we had no choice as he was transferring to a very powerful position that could have a future impact on the agency. A horrible position. Takeaways. So under pressure, the agency's board 
pretty much failed in its fiduciary duty under pressure. When, you know, under Maryland law, like most other states, boards have a duty of care. They have a duty of loyalty. Board members shouldn't be deciding on their bosses or their supervisors' compensation, for example. When they're making important decisions, they've got to do the homework and have some basis for it. The pressure on the board to produce this payout is manifest. And either the pressure was with the governor's approval or it was a misrepresentation of what the governor thought or understood, or there was some kind of miscommunication. What's further interesting is the level of control that the chief of staff, McGrath, maintained over the agency as he defended this payout. And you'll hear more about that from my colleagues. And I'll pass that on to, uh, I'll pass it on to Delegate Corman at this point. Delegate Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Madam Speaker. I think Jake is gonna share a screen. I'm not as tech savvy as uh, Chair Barron, so I'm gonna need uh, Jake to walk through my slides for me. Um, you know, Mr. McGrath has declined to come uh, before the Joint Committee uh, twice, but he has been very happy to sort of litigate these issues uh, in the press. And I think it's important to note that his uh, sort of retroactive excuses for why he was uh, entitled to this payment in his view uh, really don't add up. I mean, number one, and Chair Barron tried to dismiss this as a preliminary, but unfortunately, uh, it's something Mr. McGrath has really rested on, is he does not view the position he was in as one of state service. He viewed it as a private business. Uh, and obviously, this is contradicted by just literally everybody else. I mean, everybody but Mr. McGrath agrees MES is a state agency. It's established under state law. It's an instrumentality of the state. The governor appoints the director and five members of the board. The other three appointees to the board are appointed by the uh, director. Dr. Glass, the current director, uh, acknowledges it's a state agency. The governor referred to McGrath as making a lateral transfer within state service in an August 20th, 2020 text message to Matt Clark. We know the agency is subject to direct uh, legislation and legislative oversight. Frankly, we wouldn't be having this hearing or meeting if, uh, if it wasn't a state agency. Um, but for some reason, Mr. McGrath is very stubborn in this idea that he was not in a state government uh, position. Now, he's correct that uh, MES is not in the state personnel system. Uh, that's true. But it's not the only instrumentality of the state that sort of stands apart that way from the traditional state uh, system. Mr. McGrath, as director of MES, participated in state cabinet meetings uh, on a semi-regular basis. Uh, the CEOs of businesses are not participants in, in state cabinet me meetings. They may show up to get a certificate or a citation, but they're not participating in state uh, cabinet meetings. And of course, Mr. McGrath um, very proudly called himself a CEO. And Beth Boynton, who testified uh, willingly and openly before the Joint Committee, uh, has, was at the agency for over 30 years. And as far as she could recall, he is the first and only director of MES to sort of market himself and brand himself as a CEO. So he seemed very confident he was at a private business. Everybody else uh, at this hearing, watching this hearing, or in, in any way involved with state government understands that MES is an instrumentality of the state and not some standalone Fortune 500 company. If you could move to the next slide, Jake. So uh, somewhat stunningly for a person who briefly served as the governor's chief of staff, Mr. McGrath is really unclear on the timing of our current public health, economic and budgetary crisis. In his op-ed to the Sun, again, he's not been willing to come before us, so we have to rely on his representations to the press. Uh, he says, uh, if the same decision were being made today with the knowledge we have now, it may have been handled differently. So first of all, he goes on to say that such is better calling it an earned performance bonus and not severance. So I, clearly he hasn't learned very much from this because I don't think you just put lipstick on a pig and say that you've uh, somehow solved the problem. But I want to focus on if we had the knowledge we have now, we would handle it differently. We did have the knowledge then that we have uh, now. Uh, everybody at the time that this payout was given, was aware of the fiscal, economic, and public health situation we were in. If you turn to the next slide, these are the minutes from the meeting where the severance was given. You'll see the day at the top, May 28, 2020. Uh, you'll notice in the financial report, uh, there is a discussion of the fact that we're heading towards uh, shaky uh, budgetary waters. This is before the vote on severance 
was taken, acknowledging that there are uh, dark clouds ahead. Next slide. And of course, this is a letter I know familiar to our two presiding officers. Uh, it's addressed to you. It's the governor's veto statement issued on May 7th, 2020, three weeks before the meeting where the severance was given, in which the governor vetoed numerous pieces of legislation, citing the budgetary challenges. Yet somehow three weeks later, Mr. McGrath wants us to believe that if we knew then what we know now, we would have acted differently. And of course, we knew then what we know now. We knew we were in a difficult fiscal position for the state to say nothing of the struggles of working families in the public health crisis. Next slide. Now this actually matters uh, because while Mr. McGrath thinks he was at a Fortune 500 company, uh, he was actually at an instrumentality of the state of Maryland. If you look back at past uh, fiscal crises, MES has been helpful in supporting the state at those times. During the Great Recession, and this is an example from a, a, a DLS a budget write-up of MES, MES participated either directly by furloughing employees as part of the state uh, ordered furloughs, or reduce the cost of state projects to factor in the cost of the, uh, the savings of the furlough uh, in order to help ease the budgetary crisis that the state was facing then. So uh, it's not as though MES is a, a, a totally independent entity that would never participate if we were facing a fiscal crisis. They should have known then at that meeting that they were gonna be called upon to, uh, to assist the state during this difficult time so that we can, you know, pay for things like K through 12 education, healthcare, public safety, all the things we all care about. Uh, and we'll see later that they actually did call upon uh, Mr. McGrath when he was departing MES to, to provide assistance through MES, which he refused to do. But uh, the timing of, of when they knew the fiscal situation was occurring is important because MES has helped in, helped in these situations uh, before. Next slide, please. So Mr. McGrath really hangs his hat on the fact that uh, he deserved this severance or bonus or whatever lipstick you, uh, you want to put on it. Now, first of all, it's really important to note that as uh, Chair Barron explained, none of the financial results or uh, achievements of Mr. McGrath were in front of the board when they made the decision. So they certainly could not have been analyzing his results versus anybody else's to make this decision because they acknowledged they didn't have any of these uh, records. Uh, what you have before you uh, is more detailed than the board had before it when it made its decision. It's uh, from DLS, the revenue, expenditures, uh, cash or cash equivalents, and total net assets of MES for fiscal uh, years 14 through 19. Now, let me say that the fiscal year 20 revenue was announced about two months after Mr. McGrath's severance was awarded and does appear quite positive. It appears to be the highest revenue year of the, of the revenue years uh, shown here, but we don't yet have expenditure information, cash on hand information, total net assets. So we don't actually know their financial performance, although we know, yes, it's true, this year they've had a, uh, a fairly positive revenue year. We just don't know if that's because of anything Mr. McGrath did, if that's a trend, if it's a, if it's a bubble. Um, what you can see if you look at total net assets is that it's sort of been steadily rising from before Mr. McGrath got there. I believe Mr. McGrath joined the agency in fiscal, I want to say 17, I think, or maybe the end of fiscal 16. So the, the financial performance seems like it's just following a pattern and not necessarily anything Mr. McGrath, uh, Mr. McGrath did. Uh, and we need to explore this further. And frankly, Mr. McGrath can help us do that if he comes before us uh, by explaining how his particular management style, his particular travel schedule, his particular use of expenses uh, benefited the agency, benefited the people of Maryland, and somehow in some way in his mind entitled him to uh, basically an extra year of pay for a lateral uh, transfer. Next slide. So, you know, on the same uh, financial uh, financial records piece and to tie it back to the, the fiscal assistance, um, this is uh, the governor's office basically asking if MES can help by slowing the charging of state and local government projects to basically help state and local government with cash flow because of, uh, because of the uh, fiscal situation that all levels of government were facing. And so, first of all, Mr. McGrath says, when I first came to MES, there was literally no cash on hand aside from contingency. And if you remember back to the last slide, uh, in fiscal 15, long before Mr. McGrath got there, there was $50 million in cash and cash equivalent. So uh, that's just not an accurate statement of the reality. But you also see here, Mr. McGrath being unwilling to assist the state and local governments at their uh, time of need, despite having about, I think, 25 million cash on hand at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, fiscal 19. Uh, and of course, if you look back, the types of assistance that were being asked for during the Great Recession were in the range of two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollars from the agency, uh, which looks a lot like his uh, severance figure. 
Um, you know, all this is important, you know, not only because of the severance, but also because of some of uh, Mr. McGrath's other uh, practices. So if you could switch to the next slide. So Mr. McGrath's expenses are, I would just say, extremely concerning. Um, we have uh, exhaustive records that MES provided that show about $125,000 in reimbursed expenses over two and a half years. Uh, over $50,000 of that was done at the last minute, uh, as has been covered um, well in the press, but there was tens of thousands of dollars in expenses um, before that. And Mr. McGrath was a, uh, I'll say an active expenser. Uh, this is his uh, Costco membership. He uh, bought chocolate bark for board meetings. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you go to the next slide, he had uh, dinners. This is a dinner with him and Mr. Sharing in Washington D.C., where Mr. Sharing lives. Um, somehow, this was expense to MES, even though it's just you know two coworkers having dinner. No clear uh, idea if they uh, discussed any uh, uh, business and why this was a legit expense. I'll just say about all these. Um, some of them may be legal. Um, I, I'm not sure that we're in a position to judge that yet. They're certainly concerning and suggest maybe a lack of judgment on the part of uh, Mr. McGrath. You could flip to the next slide. Uh, there's his ice cream. He bought a couple dollars worth of ice cream and was sure to put that expense in. And then over on the left, you'll see uh, a dinner he had, uh, or a lunch rather, uh, in Annapolis with Mr. Krim, who's now in the governor's office. Just the two of them, someone from MES, someone from the governor's office, having a meal in Annapolis that was expensed. Uh, with no record as to why that would be a, a legitimate uh, a legitimate expense. And I think we asked Dr. Glass about this, the current director of MES, and you know he said this is not the kind of thing he would put in for uh, reimbursement. That's just him having lunch with a colleague. We all uh, we all do that at times. So uh, next slide. So along with this is that Mr. McGrath's expenses were not submitted on a timely basis uh, at all. And if you look at MES policies, for example, when you're traveling, you're basically supposed to get your expenses within five business days. Um, Mr. McGrath, as we said, while he was going out the door, put in for about $50,000 worth of expenses. Uh, so in June mm -hmm. of 2020, he was seeking reimbursements for things that occurred uh, as late as December or as early as December of 2019. Uh, and so these expense reimbursements, um, even if the, the subject matter of them is valid, uh, should have been rejected mm -hmm. because they're outside the, the, the time period in which you have to seek uh, reimbursement. And again, we know that he knows how to seek timely reimbursement because there's 75000 or so other dollars worth of expenses that were submitted over the course of his service. So this $50,000 uh, should, uh, should not have been accepted. Next, uh, next slide. Now, as I said, even if some of these expenses were substantively acceptable, uh, they were outside the time limit, some of them are just extremely questionable. Uh, for example, this is a $15,000 or so uh, Harvard uh, course uh, that was supposed to take place in the spring, uh, was rescheduled due to COVID-19. Mr. McGrath left uh, the governor's office, or excuse me, left MES for the governor's office, but instead of canceling his participation in the program, still sought through Mr. Sharing uh, reimbursement of this $15,000. And I'll also note the $15,000 well outside the tuition reimbursement uh, range of the policies that MES provided to us. Uh, and this is one of a number of leadership programs that Mr. McGrath uh, sought fit to participate in. He participated in the Walt Disney Leadership Institute in Orlando, uh, for, uh, for example. Next slide. And the travel. Uh, the travel just appears on its face to be excessive. I mean, once again, um, as with the expenses, some of these things may be substantially valid, but when you take them all together, they really... Uh, raise a lot of questions about what he was doing. Trips to Israel, Italy, Belgium, Las Vegas, Orlando, Phoenix, Palm Springs, and then Annapolis. Well, Annapolis isn't that big a trip, but he would spend uh, a number of overnight stays at hotels in Annapolis, even though during the course of his tenure at MES, he lived in Waldorf or Edgewater, uh, but felt the need to, to bill for overnight stays in Annapolis. Uh, the board members um, sort of admitted they were unaware of the amount of travel that was occurring. It had not been uh, monitoring it, which was a great concern. And Beth Wharton, again, uh, someone who had been uh, with the agency for about 32 years, said there were no guidelines on approving director travel, but now she, quote unquote, clearly sees MES uh, needs that. Next slide. So finally, uh, Mr. McGrath's use of an MES automobile is very unclear. There are a few automobiles that were purchased somewhat for his use during his tenure there, it seems. One, a sort of sedan and one an SUV. It appears that the SUV 
was uh, to be used by the board or uh, high level staff when they were going on sort of show and tells to uh, local governments. But Mr. McGrath in this text message, you'll see uh, claims that he only occasionally drove uh, one car, which was not the SUV. No vehicle was ever purchased for his use. And to the contrary, in his first 90 days, he had a longstanding agency practice of providing free vehicles for executives. The email on the other side is from Ms. Wharton to Mr. McGrath, in which uh, she says, I hope you're enjoying your first official day. That's as the governor chief of staff. As per your direction, we are in the process of transferring the MES vehicle you've been using over to the governor's office. If he wasn't using the MES vehicle, as he claims in this text message, why was he asking that it be transferred over to the governor's office? Those two things just do not add up. And of course, Mr. McGrath hasn't seen fit to come before us to explain himself. He also requested that I believe his cell phone and laptop uh, be transferred over to the governor's office. The last time we asked, it was not clear if these items had been recovered yet because they are state property. They are not Mr. McGrath's property. They're not the property of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, these practices need to be uh, thoroughly discussed and understood with Mr. McGrath, what he was thinking and how he thought this benefited both the Maryland Environmental Service uh, and the state of Maryland. And with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Chair Land. Senator Lamb. Thank you. Thank you, Delga Corman, um, for that presentation. All very good information. Um, I'd like to um, just paint a broader picture as it portrays um, the expenditures and the need to have um, Mr. McGrath appear before the Joint Committee. Um, as was cited earlier, um, we did reach out to Mr. McGrath and also his colleague, Mr. Sharing, to request his participation, their participation at um, our prior Joint Committee on Fair Practices and State Personnel Oversight. Um, multiple um, uh, attempts were also made by email and by phone to reach Ms. McGrath and sharing, um, and committee staff is happy to provide these documents um, if requested. We did provide ample time for them to respond. Unfortunately, uh, we did not hear um, a response. Um, this is concerning because it does seem to um, convey a troublesome pattern of disregard and account for accountability and oversight. These are individuals who work for the state of Maryland, for a state agency, um, and the legislature funds these state agencies. And so in many respects, it's not appropriate um, and paints a disturbing picture really when agency directors and leaders sum their nose at the legislature and decline to attend at the request of the legislature, which is why we have to take these types of extraordinary steps um, before this committee now. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So what's also concerning in all of this is that while Mr. McGrath and, and Mr. Sharing have declined to appear before the joint committee to answer formal questions um, from the committee and its members, they have no reservations about communicating publicly um, or with the press. Um, just not with the legislature. You'll see that these are posts from Mr. McGrath on um, his Facebook feed um, in August, shortly after the Baltimore Sun article came out. Uh, on the left here, he's defending his severance package as standard business practices, and that he contends that he wasn't in a state job, um, which um, is is really not true based on the prior facts that have been presented. He also disputes the quote facts um, that were in the Sun article, but provides no justification or explanation for what he considers to not be factual in those articles. You can go to the next slide, please. And so he continues to defend his actions, um, both online and um, in the press. He as you can see here, uh, last month, just about a, just over a month ago, wrote and agreed to a lengthy op-ed that was published in the Baltimore Sun, where he conveyed his perspectives, again, giving no opportunity to the public or to um, the joint committee to uh, ask any questions. You go to the next slide. And he was, as the prior email showed, given an opportunity to appear uh, before the joint committee with Ms. Voighton, um, but declined. Instead, he decided to refute her testimony uh, via the Baltimore Sun in written responses rather than appearing in person to do so, as you can see from this excerpt from the Sun article earlier this month. Next slide. He also responded to the Sun to defend his expenditures, including overseas travel to Italy, 
and also to um, the executive leadership course at Harvard after he left MES that Delegate Corman cited earlier. Um, of note, he had Mr. Sharing pay for his course at Harvard and expense it that way. And he even wrote that it was part of uh, Mr. Sharing's job to regularly register him for conferences and other events. And of note, Mr. Sharing is the, or was the deputy, was the director of operations at MES. Go to the next slide. And so, um, you know, after the governor released a press statement um, making clear um, what his perspective on the MES situation was, um, Mr. McGrath continued to defend himself in the press. Um, he disputes the governor's contention that the governor was not aware of the severance package before the board vote, and he stands by his statement on this matter, as you can see in this excerpt from a Sun article um, just about a month ago. You go to the next slide. And he's pretty prolific in reaching out to the press because not only was he exclusive to the Sun, but here you can see that he also reached out to the Washington Post and defended himself in written statements as well. You go to the next slide. Um, and Mr. Sharing, who's his colleague or was his colleague at MES and was um, the director of operations at the agency, has also been um, reaching out to um, uh, you know, bloggers and others to convey his perspective. Here he's communicated with Ryan Miner, who hosts the news blog source. In it, he talks about his termination and defended overseas trips that he took with Mr. McGrath. Um, but again, given an opportunity to appear before the joint committee, he did not respond to repeated uh, attempts by email and by phone. You can go to the next slide. And so even after the joint committee's earlier hearings, Mr. McGrath reached out directly to Governor Hogan by text, pleading for help. These are text messages that were provided by the governor's legal counsel and turned over to the joint committee. As you can see, Mr. McGrath is perfectly willing to reach out to his former employer and boss, the governor, to strategize about PR, optics, and communications on MES, but again, did not appear willing to, uh, did not, was not willing to appear before the joint committee. Um, and so we are concerned because there must be uh, some responsibility for institutional integrity and respect for legislative oversight and a need for accountability and transparency, particularly for individuals who are working as part of an agency of the state. If you go to the next slide, um, and there continue to be concerning questions about Mr. McGrath's involvement in MES even after he left the agency and became the governor's chief of staff. Before the scandal became public, he continued to meddle in MES's operations, as you can see here. Um, this really led to um, the warning letter that's appearing on the screen by Governor Hogan's legal counsel, admonishing him for continuing to do so and reminding him that he should recuse himself from all matters pertaining to MES while serving as chief of staff. This leaves, this leaves open questions that the Joint Committee would like to understand and examine, such as what prompted this warning. What were Mr. McGrath's continued involvement in MES that um, occurred well into the beginning of August? What were his interests at MES at that, in MES at that time? Um, he really, in his position as the chief of staff, um, has every single agency and department of the state to oversee and manage in some way. Why did he continue to be so interested in MES? Was it because of Mr. Sharing and the fact that Mr. Sharing remained at MES? We simply don't know, and we can't get any answers without hearing directly from Mr. McGrath or Mr. Shearing. Um, but he obviously defied this order several weeks later by reaching out directly to the current director of MES, Dr. Glass, to initiate efforts to draft a press release to spin and justify his severance payment. Go to the next slide, please. So, you know, as, as the um, Senate president mentioned earlier in the opening remarks, I think there is concern about the structure of uh, the MES board. And I think um, that's become apparent through the hearings that the joint committee has had. Uh, there are nine total board members for MES. Um, 
And you can see here that the board chair is also the executive director, or in Mr. McGrath's case, he called himself the CEO, um, also the deputy director. Um, the treasurer, um, while Mr. McGrath was the uh, director or CEO, the treasurer was, in this instance, the director of finance. Um, and then there was a secretary and five other board members. Um, you know, the way that this is structured, I think, presents a lot of concerns and questions. Um, is it, does it make sense really to have the executive, executive director control the board uh, seats in this way? Because it could present an inherent conflict, especially when they're subordinates to the executive director serving on the board itself. As many of us have served on, um, you know, nonprofit boards and, and business boards, corporate boards, for example, um, the board really is there to provide um, oversight over the um, chief executive and perhaps some of the other executives and directors. Um, but if you have subordinates of the director serving on the board itself, it really calls into the question whether there's proper oversight by the board of the chief executive or director. You can go to the next slide. Um, and this confusion becomes clear here. Right, and so you see from these text messages between Dr. Glass, the current director of MES and Mr. McGrath, um, that really there's a sense of entitlement for the individual that may be serving as the executive director to have control over the board. And so even in this message that's highlighted here, Mr. McGrath and, and Dr. Glass joked about their control over the board. Is the executive director supposed to control the board or is the board supposed to oversee and control the executive director. Um, who's, who's reporting to who in this case? Um, the situation seems to really be turned upside down when the director seems to have full control over the board, even um, you know, remarking that he can't recall a single no vote in the four years of his tenure leading the agency. Um, you know, I think it, it really calls into the question the structure. I'm not certain of the history of why it was structured this way, because obviously this spans back um, several decades, um, but it begs the question of why and how we can reform this moving forward. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and it's, it's clear that there was a total lack of oversight uh, by the board and the director's travel and expenses. Um, this was cited, I believe, by um, Delga Corman as well. And um, this is um, an excerpt out of the Baltimore Sun um, from September 2nd, 2020. Um, Jake, if you can go ahead and play the first slide or for the first clip rather um, from our prior hearing. You guys are had mentioned. You guys are really the ones who mentioned this fear. Um, if you want to answer that question, it'd be great. It was a perception that you have the the governor and the, one of the other most powerful people in the state um, speaking for the governor, or supposedly speaking for the governor and himself. That we had no reason to doubt at that point in time that what he was saying was true. That the governor knew about it. And like I said earlier, with the knowledge and circumstances we had at the time, we did what we thought was in the best interest of MES. Was it right? Looking back on it, possibly or probably not. But we did what we thought was best at that point in time. Okay. With all due respect, it was most definitely not, because based on what I'm seeing in emails and the text messages, is that it's a, the word anticipated was used twice. Um, so it hasn't been verified. When I, and if I sat on that board, I would most definitely want from Mr. McGrath um, something very conclusive from the governor's office that this is something that they were okay with. Um, and not anything that basically said anticipated. There's a big difference between anticipated and approved, um, especially when we're talking about this much money. So I think it was a huge mistake. And it almost gives the impression that you guys almost, you know, to the point where you guys are sort of rubber stamping any um, – anything that's that's proposed by the executive director or your previous executive director in this case. Um, and my, my question for you guys too, um, in that with, with severance um, in the cases where you have an at will appointed position, a severance is there to protect that person um, for any termination 
um, or any separation um, that is um, that's unjustified or, or one that's um, where they're terminated um, without cause. Um, so, you know what, I just don't, we don't, it's not fitting anymore. You know what, this is, we don't like their politics. We don't like the color of the socks they're wearing that day. So we're just going to let you go. In that case, that then, then they're, um, then you would pay out that severance. In this case, and I think in other cases in the past with them, so from what I understand, um, it, when they leave on, at their own will, you guys are still offering a severance, which that doesn't make sense. I don't know of any other organization um, that does that. Um, so, was was that question ever asked in, in any of these board meetings? Thank you, Jake. Um, and this clip was actually intended to go with the prior slide, and I apologize about that. And we're trying to fiddle with um, technology here. If you could also play the next clip, Jake. Meetings um, when you all make. I would say 2017, 2017. Yeah. Right, Mr. McGrath arrived halfway through. So his strategic investment paid off really quickly, it seems like, uh, and then started to jump around a little bit uh, again. Um, he also, um, if you scroll down to the email a little bit, Jake. So the governor was very concerned, as I think we all are, about the economic situation and, and saw from all the different state agencies, uh, ways that we could um, help. And one of those ideas was to see if we could basically delay payments, I think from the localities uh, to MES for certain projects to help with their cash flow situation. And Mr. McGrath in the second paragraph here, um, if you wanna read it when I first came, starting with that one. Um, unfortunately, I can't. I'll read it. When I first came to MES, there was literally no cash on hand aside from contingency, and the board and management were arguing about whether or not to establish a credit line. They did not. Uh, and so if you scroll back up, and we look at... So thank you, Jake. Um, this really was trying to show clips from the prior hearings that demonstrated um, the fact that Mr. McGrath seemed to... Um, believe that he had full control over the board, that he was able to take actions almost pretty loosely when it came to board oversight and um, felt that because he had control over so many of the board members that he had the flexibility to be able to do so. Um, it is really concerning when you look at that and when you tie that to the lack of oversight over travel and expenses. Um, if uh, Jake, you can play the next clip. Um, Senator Benson, but you know, are were the board members aware that Mr. McGrath had taken so many out-of-state trips? You know, I think just reference were ones to Naples, Italy, and Israel, both international trips. But a review of the expenses that he had submitted also showed that he had traveled to Miami, Palm Beach, Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, New York, Las Vegas, Palm Desert, California, Orlando, and Tucson all in a three and a half year span that he served as the executive director. I don't know if prior executive directors had made so many out of state trips. This is after all the Maryland environmental services. Um, but, you know, were you aware of all of these trips and what he was doing out there? Jake, you can move on to the next clip, please. I, what I see as a problem, and it has never been up until here recently, is that there's not specific guidelines on who approves the director's expenditures and, and travel. Um, we didn't need it before, um, but now clearly I say MES needs that. And if you can go to the next clip, please. Twentieth. 2020. You had cited earlier in your testimony, I think it was in your opening statement, that you were made very clear, it was made very clear to you that you were not to ask about certain expenditures by Mr. McGrath or Mr. Sharing. Is that correct? 
correct. Who made that clear to you? Um, again, I'm not going to say employees' names, um, but we can talk about that offline if you'd like. It was multiple employees, and it usually was relative to expenses around the um, environmental business leadership conference. Can you can go to the next clip, please, Jake. Jacks. Mr. McGrath did not have an MES credit card and apparently used his personal card for expenses. I heard from more than one employee that they were told by Matthew Shearing on behalf of Mr. McGrath that I was not to be told about certain expenditures made by uh, Mr. McGrath or, or Matthew. I feel like Mr. McGrath and I got along relatively well as long as I achieved the results that he wanted, but we definitely had different perspectives on how the agency should be run. Jake, you more can than once, I was. So thank you. Obviously, there are concerns with um, Mr. McGrath's expenditures, travel, um, and other expenditures that have taken place during his tenure at the agency. These were highlighted through multiple instances, both at the board level and uh, with Ms. Voighton when she testified before the Joint Committee. Um, you know, without with without Mr. McGrath or Mr. Sharing present, it's hard to get at the bottom and. Um, understand the justifications and rationale for these types of expenditures. And so um, that further supports the need for them to appear. Um, if you go to the next slide, Jake. Um, this slide uh, reviews the appointment responsibility for the members of the board. As you can see here, um, there are six of the nine members which are directly appointed by the governor. Um, including the board chair and then the five other uh, members. And then there are three members that are appointed directly by the executive director. That includes the uh, vice chair, the treasurer, and the secretary. And in an earlier um, press conference, Governor Hogan contended that he was not familiar with MES. Jake, can you go ahead and play that next clip? And uh, we thought he would be a good choice. Was not aware of any of these current issues that just uh, we're now hearing about. You know, MES is a strange creature that was created by the legislature. It's not really under our purview. Um, don't not, don't know much about what goes on over there. But we hadn't heard a single complaint ever in three years until you know all of this just in the past few weeks. Ed Bratner, thank you. So the governor obviously um, contends that he does not have. Um, you know, full awareness of what's taking place there. But the governor does have full control of the board. As we mentioned, he appoints six of the nine members. And so the contention that he barely knows MES as an agency really strains credulity. Um, so, you know, you can see here that MES has be appeared before the Board of Public Works, of which he is one of uh, only three members on that board. Um, they've testified there. They provided supported documentation, which is usually carefully reviewed by all the members of the board. Go to the next slide. Here's a speech that um, Governor Hogan gave earlier as part of documents that uh, the governor's office had provided over to the joint committee, clearly giving a speech uh, remarking and commending MES for um, some strong work regionally um, on environmental projects. You go to the next slide. And I think as Delegate Corman mentioned earlier, um, there are members of MES that even appeared before the governor's cabinet. So um, there seems to be some clear awareness at the highest levels of what MES does um, and briefing um, occasions that have taken place that should have conveyed um, you know, the agency's mission and responsibility. You go to the next slide. So we're also interested in hearing from Mr. Sharing because of his knowledge and work at MES, which seems really integral to some of the efforts that Mr. McGrath had undertaken there. Um, we were told by Ms. Whiten that the position uh, that Mr. Sharing um, had was new, that it did not exist before him and that the position was, was made for him. Um, it's not clear exactly what his responsibilities were at MES. As I mentioned, he holds the title of Director of Operations, but he seemed to also um, have many other uh, responsibilities, including putting on conferences and expensing um, activities and uh, other conferences and travel for Mr. McGrath. 
Um, he and Mr. McGrath have a long history together. They used to uh, work together at a prior um, uh, association, national association. Um, and so it appears based on Ms. Voighton's testimony that Mr. Sharon was brought to MES um, by Mr. McGrath. Um, so it also calls into questions his background and, and qualifications for the job. Um, he did not appear to have any uh, apparent uh, connections to environmental type programs um, prior to taking on this job at MES and yet assuming the title director of operations on a very large um, and uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars state agency. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, the appropriateness of him sharing or submitting expenses on behalf of Mr. McGrath. Um, next slide, please. Um, he was, Mr. Sharon was heavily involved in the press release from MES that was released on August 15th that Mr. McGrath initiated and assisted upon um, over the better decision of uh, Dr. Glass, who expressed that he preferred that the um, press release not be compiled and released. Um, you can see here that there are text messages uh, communicating um, between Mr. Sharing and the governor's office and their communication staff. Next slide. And even after Mr. McGrath's departure from MES, Mr. Sharing would continue to consult with him. These are two text messages from June 22nd, uh, over three weeks after Mr. McGrath left MES to become the governor's chief of staff. And Mr. Sharing is consulting with Mr. McGrath about the MES org chart here, which uh, Mr. McGrath no notably responded that he should remove all references to the CEO and COO now that his tenure at MES had ended because it was a quote exception. Next slide. And if you can play the, the next clip, uh, Jake. So, uh, not that's, that wasn't the point I made. Um, I had employees that were assigned to work on EBLC, Environmental Business Leadership Conference that um, Mr. Sharing would tell them not to tell me about the expenditures that were being made towards the conference. Why do you think these expenditures were being withheld from you? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I always have uh, issues with spending money and, and maybe that's, they thought that it would, I don't know, don't know. If you could stop the clip there. So the, as you can tell, these are disturbing allegations that the MES deputy director, Ms. Voighton, um, conveyed that she was not told to, she was told to not question expenditures by Mr. Sharing about a conference that MES has been putting on, the Environmental Business Leadership Conference. It begs the question of what is so secretive about the EBLC that uh, the deputy director could not be told about expenditures that took place. What was its primary purpose and was there an ulterior, ulterior motive or alternative uh, intent behind this conference? It certainly raises suspicions that the deputy director was not able to question expenditures of the director and the director of operations. Uh, and these are only questions that Mr. McGrath and Mr. Sharing can answer. So if you can tell from, from this presentation, there seems to be um, many outstanding questions about the appropriateness of these expenditures um, and whether it was appropriate, for example, for Mr. Sharing to be sh submitting expenditures on behalf of Mr. McGrath. Uh, we would like to have Mr. Sharing explain his hiring, his role and involvement in the press release and submitting expenses. Um, Mr. Sharing also appeared to have participated in some of Mr. McGrath's trips and it calls into question for what purpose. So there remain outstanding questions about the roles and departures, um, not only of these two individuals, but other uh, subordinates of Mr. McGrath and Mr. Sharing as well, including Dan Ferraro and Sally Wong, who was their uh, former director of procurement, I believe has left the agency. So in closing, I'm concerned not only about the lack of accountability and transparency over the state agency, but what this means for the potential politicization of our department's programs and personnel here in the state. Viewed on its own, it is disturbing enough that there seemed to be a complete lack of responsibility over spending and executive level decisions. I'm also worried that it points to a troublesome pattern of personnel problems, particularly when it comes to the administration's political appointees. When you hear about the circumstances of Mac Love at the Governor's Office of Community Initiatives, Steve Krim at the Department of Budget and Management, and now Mr. McGrath and Mr. Sharing at Maryland Environmental Services, 
I'm concerned that this points to a broader picture of unqualified or poorly qualified personnel being appointed to, to serve critical roles in state government, particularly uh, with little experience and possibly little oversight at the taxpayer's dime. I'm also worried that this could be the tip of the iceberg of using state positions to achieve political gains, a point that even Mr. Love was alleging took place. Overall, this is deeply concerning. I think it demonstrates a pattern that needs to be examined further by the Joint Committee. And with that, let me pass along to Senator Carter. Senator Carter. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in addition to the issues of around lack of accountability and potential conflict of interest that have been so aptly highlighted by the other members of the Joint Committee, the overarching issues uh, are one, the culture of toxicity um, that existed in the, in the environment at MES that could be, could possibly interfere with the mission. And the other, of course, is very similar to what we saw at University of Maryland Medical System, a culture of self-dealing by political appointees. This calls into question our need to uh, explore whether this is a pattern at other state, quasi-state and independent agencies in Maryland. Um, I will not present slides or a video, but I would like to highlight some points of the testimony from the testimony of Ms. Woten, who testified on September the 2nd before our committee. Ms. Woten was at MES in different capacities for 32 years, and she ended her career as deputy director and for a very short time acting director. Um, her testimony was very disturbing in many ways. You've heard some excerpts from it from the previous presentations. However, these are the highlights of what she had to say, which are part of the public record. That in her 32 years, she had never experienced a culture or leadership of an agency as the way it was run by uh, Mr. McGrath that Mr. McGrath created an unpleasant work environment, that he would not tolerate criticism or negative feedback. He instituted policies and procedures that were difficult to defend or explain. She was running the day-to-day -day operations at that point and was unable to often explain or account for his directives. He was tough on employees. She said that he had a vindictive side, that he was never around. Ms. Wilton testified that Mr. McGrath, as you, you've heard before, uh, was more interested in his own personal image and media persona. You've seen evidence that he had hard to explain um, contracts uh, for media, media image building and expenditures. He was secretive. Mr. Sharing, on Mr. McGrath's behalf, told employees not to tell Ms. Wilton of certain expenditures as you've seen in the prior presentation. Mr. McGrath changed the policy of approval for his own expenses at the agency. It was clear to Ms. Wilton that even after he left, he was in control still of the agency. And so even though we heard the direct testimony from Ms. Wilton, we heard from um, Mr. Glass, we heard from many members of the board past and present the only way that we're really going to get to the truth of what happened and, and determine where we go from here would be to hear directly from Mr. McGrath as to what happened while he was at the agency. Thank you, uh, Senator Carter, um, and thank you, uh, joint chairs of the committee uh, and uh, Delegate Corman. Um, the members of the panel will now be open to question. Are there any questions from members of the committee? It appears that we have a question from Chairwoman Kelly. Chair Kelly. Well, it's more of a quick comment and I, I appreciate the opportunity to make it because I've got an upcoming, an, an additional legislative meeting in a few minutes. Uh, I found it very uh, compelling, the presentations that have been given. One thing not mentioned, which I'm sure everybody is aware of, is that a very significant percentage of the MES budget is provided not by private entities, 
but by state government and localities, our local uh, counties. And uh, so in light of everything that you have discovered, everything that you have laid out, I think that is something else that would lead us to wonder if when you're done with this particular entity, we need to look at how we are positioned with regard to other quasi and independent state entities such as MES. And we might in the long run, maybe in an additional legislative year, need to be sure we put some guardrails up. Uh, I have found this very enlightening and appreciate the work that the, uh, both committees have done, the fair practices and the uh, co-chairs of this committee. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committees? Hearing none, uh, recognizing House Majority Leader Lukey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Mr. President, I move to issue a subpoena requiring Roy McGrath and Matthew Sharing to appear to testify before the Joint Committee on Fair Practices and Personnel Oversight within the next 30 days or on a mutually agreed date, including any documents related to this testimony. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. President. Chair recognizes the present pro tem, uh, Melanie Griffith. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I'm going to second the motion that the House Majority Leader just made. Um, the, the Joint Committee has made a strong case and laid out the fact that they don't have the information they need to do their functions in oversight and there needs to be accountability. So I second that motion. The motion has been moved and properly seconded. Is there any discussion? Chair recognizes the Chair of Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs, Senator Pinsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first of all, I support the motion, but I do have a question. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Um, under the subpoena, would any witnesses be under oath and would the role of perjury come into play? If uh, mem the attorney general we can, is available for any um, clarifying questions, but uh, my understanding is yes, that if they're subpoenaed, they're in front of an official body. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, staff to the committee, Ms. Necessary, please call the roll. Right. Speaker Jones? Yes. President Ferguson? Yes. Delegate Barron? Yes. Delegate Clippinger? Yes. Delegate Davis? Yes. Delegate DeMay? Yes. Senator Feldman? Yes. Senator Griffith? Yes. Senator Gazzoni? Yes. Senator Hershey? I think he's here. I guess we'll come back. Senator Jennings? Yes. Delegate Kaiser? Yes. Senator Kelly? Yes. Senator King? Yes. Delegate Kipke? Yes. Delegate Corman? Yes. Senator Lee? Yes. Delegate Lutke? Yes. Senator Miller. Let's come back. Come back. Okay. Um, let's see where do I leave off? Delegate Pendergrass. Yes. Senator Pinsky. Yes. Delegate Sample Hughes. Yes. Delegate Shalega. Yes. Senator Zucker. Yes. 
Senator Hershey, yes. Yep, there you are. And do we have Senator Miller? Mm. We will we will circle back. Um, if staff could please read uh, the vote. So that's uh, 23 votes uh, yes and, and no opposition. So 23 to zero. The motion unanimously passes. Madam Speaker. We look forward to um, hearing back from the joint committee and thank you everyone for your time. The meeting is now adjourned. Could I be recorded as yes, this is Mike Miller. Good. I apologize, I wasn't in the room when the roll was called. Thank you, Senator. We will make note. Thank you.